Hi guys, Zach here. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. This gives you access to over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, and Kindle, as well as an MP3 player. Right now, I'm reading Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the making of a masterpiece by Michael Benson. But Audible users can also access other film books, such as Hank and Jim, The 50-Year Friendship of Henry Fonda and James Stewart by Scott Iman, or Five Came Back by Mark Harris. Again, the link to get your 30-day free trial is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. One more time, www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. Now, on to the show. Welcome to episode 197 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Lydia Creech. That's it. Lydia and I are going to take you through movies this week. Lydia and Zach, rocking out. Sorry, the last time we were alone together, it was Treasure Planet, and... (laughs) What a weird episode. Yeah. So if you're a fan of if you're a fan of that those types of episodes, I don't know, we got something for you. Uh, we got some movies that we saw this week, and then in part two, we uh, both Lydia and I talked to Mark Lafanu, a uh, film critic in London, about the 1932 film Vampire as por- part of the Young Critics Watch Old Movies series, a uh, nice little Carl Dreyer film. Uh, but yeah, we talked about Dreyer and and the film and uh spatial continuity yeah it's not it's it's kind of funny it's not a super scary movie uh we we kind of and then we get a lot we dig a lot into like the the cinematography i don't know if that gets too insider baseball but it was something mark was very uh was very adamant on that so um we kind of dig in on on the cinematography of this movie but let's go ahead lydia and jump into movies that we saw this week and we both watched a it's not a new release, but it's a it, it is a release nonetheless, um, and that is 1952's High Noon. Uh, it's directed by Fred Zinnemann, and it stars Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly, and Thomas Mitchell. And pretty much the story is Gary Cooper is the town marshal of this you know western town in the middle of nowhere, and he is at the when we pick up the movie he is marrying grace kelly's character who is a quaker and they're going to leave the town and run a shop together he's you know putting up his badge and gun and he's giving it all up but of course while he's doing that uh word gets out because some of the gang members show up that this gang leader and outlaw who Gary Cooper's character put away uh, a number of years before, uh, they thought it was going to be for life. And in, he ended up getting parole and he's coming back to town Five years to ago. Ki- you know, shoot Gary Cooper and shoot the uh, people who wronged him. And so over the course of the movie, uh, Gary Cooper is attempting to round up a posse of people to help him you know fight this guy and he's not yeah and he's and he's not and he's not uh he's not having to much luck but, to legally. yeah this is it, it's currently on film struck i think it's it's gonna be gone at the end of may though uh but you know lydia what did you make of high noon i know kind of both of us are, are big western fans and i feel like this is one of the 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 big ones that people usually talk about it's a really snappy little western uh i think i really like old tired and sweaty gary cooper like he's having a really hard time and i relate uh (laughs) it's he's he's just over it the entire time he's just like i don't want to be doing this like it's (laughs) he just wants to retire and live his married life and it's so far been well yeah he married grace (laughs) kelly he was like i want to go marry grace kelly and do that but i gotta go and fight this dude and it's so and everybody's being mean to me and it's so far far below his dignity to have to beg these townspeople to help him for their own good is basically his argument and everyone's like why don't you just why don't you just leave (laughs) which is kind of a good question 
Yeah, no, I, I think that that's the that, that's what's so great about the movie. Um, one of the things is, yeah, it, it's very. You, you mentioned at the beginning that it's snappy. It's only it's under an hour and a half long, and it, it really does it. There's no exposition. It kind of just tosses you into this story. Like I said, you literally pick up Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly's character as they're getting married, and uh, the beauty of the screenplay, which was written by Carl Foreman, is that it. Uh, it it fleshes out the clear kind of those those underlying issues that people in the town clearly had with Gary Cooper and it it's kind of one of those when he needs the most those kind of flare up and he and he realizes how much or how little people uh you know, are willing to, to step up and help him. It's funny because or a lot just of not dependable yeah, or dependable. And, and it's, it's funny because during the, the wedding sequence, you have these, the, the town kind of elder people and they're all wishing him well and talking about how he's the best marshal. And then, there's a great scene, you know, about an hour into the movie. We're about to get to the big shootout, and he he goes into the church and is pleading with, you know, give, pleading his case. And one of the men who is there, who is you know, high marks, was really high on him or earlier in the movie, has this long monologue, and he, and he is played by. Uh, uh, by Thomas Mitchell, who uh, for other westerns, you, you've seen him in a lot of other westerns. I remember him as the drunk doctor and stagecoach. But he gives this great monologue where, at the beginning, you think, "Oh, he's going to kind of inspire everybody to to band together and 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 help Gary Cooper." And then it just takes a, a like a giant one eighty, and he's like, "You know." Maybe we shouldn't, and maybe you should just get out of here. And in conclusion, you should yeah, leave. It's, and it's great because it, you could just see you just see uh, Gary Cooper's gut just drop and go, "What just happened?" Like that—that's not how I saw this going. And I, I, I think that uh, the all of those those kind of subtleties, all of those uh, you know issues that are simmering below the surface. Are it, it, they're just handled so well, and that's what's so great about the movie is that uh, nothing. It, there's no massive outburst. Even really, the shootout does not have the the giant panache the, yeah, the sh- of, of of other ones. I mean, the shootout. It, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I told you the shootout reminded me a great deal of the shootout in McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Slightly less pathetic because he doesn't like die by himself at the end of it but it's still like not very courageous and it's just a lot of hiding and kind of i don't know it just feels sad because he's old and he doesn't want to and yeah uh i think one of the other things i really liked about high noon was just the structure because occasionally it would just because basically the amount of the movie is the amount of time it's a little bit on either side but it keeps cutting back to the clock like counting down and he's like I gotta leave my office for five minutes and he puts the note on the door and it's just like Jesus what did you make of uh, the the kind of I guess B plot you could say for the film which was uh, this character uh, Mrs. Ramirez that Katie uh, Urado plays and she and she clearly has a history with Gary Cooper's character and uh, at the beginning of the movie she's dealing a lot with Lloyd Bridges his character who of course kind of makes his way into Gary Cooper's plot line but for the most part of the movie it's her and Grace Kelly kind of uh, banding together to do their opposite thing from what, what Gary Cooper's doing I mean what did, did you did that B plot hold your attention it held my attention I felt I really liked just the euphemism they were like she's she was friends <laughs> she's friends with him and you can tell both of them are just super pissed at him for how stubborn and weird he is about, I guess, his honor, what he feels is the right thing to do. And they kind of bond with each other, just like, I don't know, he's not gonna, he's not leaving. Why? Uh, and I feel like maybe Gary Cooper just d- doesn't treat either of them right, because their marriage just. It's, it's, they're gonna have a lot of unhappy conversations <laughs> about it. Yeah, it's it's a movie that does not leave on like a, you know, riding off into the sunset happiness. It's a very rushed ending because, um, I guess she's, spoil- 
she's a Quaker, so she's anti uh, gun violence. And so the reason at, he's retiring at the very beginning is because she doesn't believe in it. And like you're trying to allude to spoilers, she saves his life at the end of the movie by murdering a man in the back, which. <laughs> yeah, the outlaw who's chasing him. Which is probably she lost her like brother and father to gun violence and it seems like this movie is kind of like hey you you might have ideals or whatever about it but when it's yours and yours i don't know it's uncomfortable to say the least i think it, it just kind of falls into that american western mentality where it you know it, it kind of fits into this reminded me one reminded me of two John Ford movies, both uh, the man who shot Liberty Valance and the searchers where it's kind of like that moment at the end when she shoots the outlaw. And I mean, I think on one level you understand it's, it's, it's to save her husband and, and she, you know, and she has that opportunity to do that. Um, but it's again, it's not like after she does that, it's like this rah rah. You did so well, and she kind of has like a turning over, you know, of of her views on on gun violence or anything. Like I said, it's a very rushed ending because that happens, and they kind of just rush them together, get them on a, on you know, with a horse and buggy, and get them out of there, and then it just ends. And it's not it, you kind of leave with is that like is that partnership gonna you know be okay this there's clearly going to be some deep rooted issues and it kind of reminds you of the, both of those movies uh, both liberty valance and the and the searchers where it leaves you on a very uh kind of sour note it's it's not it's not you know great american west I mean, implying, amazing ending no and it's like really implying that to make it out in the west you kind of have to give up on maybe more genteel ideas of what's right and wrong and in, I don't you're left uncomfortable about Gary Cooper's character like how it all worked out with the townspeople because they did not help him there's a really beautiful camera move right before the shootout starts of him stepping out into the street and the camera comes back and it's just empty like he didn't get his posse there's four men coming to kill him and it's like hey you lived but Jesus you found out the hard way that nobody's got your back yeah, and he kind of seems at the end like he's just getting out of there. He's just like, F you people. I'm just, I'm getting, come on. Like, well, let's go take our screwed up marriage now and get out of here. Uh, it's, Again, it, I relate. It, I loved it. Yeah, it's just every <laughs> everything is so screwed up at the end and it just ends and you're just, and it's a little, it's a little bit uh, kind of a gut punch because you're just like, well, 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 shit, like what's going to happen now? And it's just like the end. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, it, the, the movie also is, <laughs> is pretty well known because it, it, uh, the, the, the story structure is some is, is, was structured as kind of a parable to the Hollywood blacklist and McCarthy era and, you know, naming names, uh, I haven't I, I haven't read the book. I, I the author's name's is escaping me, but I, there's the, a book really kind of talking about that and, and, and digging in on on the making of the movie and how it was related to that. Um, is that something that you kind of could pick up on, or or maybe afterwards you realized? Uh, maybe if I read the book. Oh, it's just looked it up. It's High Noon: The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic by G- Glenn Frankel. Uh, maybe if I read that thesis laid out, because I do kind of get this kind of somber, disappointed mood throughout the whole thing, but I'm not necessarily sure I would have jumped immediately to Blacklist. It's it's definitely after watching this movie and enjoying it, I'm going to definitely check out the book at some point. Uh, yeah, that certainly... <laughs> I would like it to read yeah. that. Uh, but yeah, like I said, High Noon, it is on Filmstruck for probably a couple more days. I Like I said, it's, it's only a really an hour and watch. 25 it's minutes great. long. Yeah, it's it's super quick. So I I think if you're interested in that, uh, I think it is a really interesting movie. So, so definitely check it out. Um, and going to the new release uh, sphere, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about Deadpool 2, which was the big movie release this past weekend. Uh, this is the sequel to, of course, Deadpool, which is the Ryan Reynolds starring film about a foul-mouthed 
mercenary who is also an X-Men mutant. Um, the first one... Is his superpower that he knows he's in a movie? Yeah. The, <laughs> or comic books? I'm unclear. This, this, this movie... Like, the first movie was was heralded because it was very self-aware and this one especially the marketing and all of that stuff has really been ramping that up um but in this one this one uh the first one was directed by tim miller this one is directed by david leach who directed the first john wick and atomic blonde uh i'll just say up front you would not be able (laughs) i I, will i'll just say up front like those are both movies that people kind of associate with this very stylized action and if you told me I, you couldn't tell that from Deadpool 2. There, I mean, it's fine, but it's nothing that really you go, oh, this is from the person behind John Wick or something like that. Uh, clearly showing that Chad Stahelski, who did the second John Wick, might be the real mastermind on that on that duo. Um, but yeah, so the, for the, the first movie, I thought was fine. It, it's the... I don't know. I think that the 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 issue that I guess I I have with the with both of these movies and this one, you know, the plot is is you know relatively inconsequential. Uh, it adds uh, Josh Brolin, uh, Zazie Beetz, um, Ju- uh, Julian Dennison from Hunt for the for the Wilder People to the cast, um, and it's pretty much uh, Julian Dennison is playing this mutant who. Is who breaks out of this uh, house for, for that, that is using you know is is testing on mutants and and abusing them and so uh, he he is imprisoned with Deadpool and then you have this whole time traveling thing. I don't feel like getting into it. It's it's just Thanks. comic book minutia. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, just, they're trying to they're trying to get they're God trying to get damn. the kid back. That's a, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll will say this about the second Deadpool, which is a better movie than the first Deadpool, is it's for better or worse, it's a little less dudish, if that makes sense. It's a lot less broy. Um, the first one is very is very uh, bro masculine, and this is this takes it a little bit off some, which which helps to make it a little bit more entertaining. But I think at the heart of the issue with these movies is less the self-awareness and all of this stuff but and i guess it does kind of play a, a, a little bit of a role in it but it, these movies kind of base their their comedy less on like constructed jokes and more like pop culture references it's 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 pretty much kind of like sup, uh, supplanting something like family guy uh to, to a movie script because it's not like it's it's yeah, it's not like it's structured co- comedic jokes. It's a lot of pop culture references. It's, it's a lot of references and, and offhand remarks to other comic book lore that the people who are coming to this movie will recognize because they've been watching these DC or Marvel movies and will laugh whenever he makes kind of a snide remark about one of the other uh, one of the other movies that that, that superhero movies that have come out recently. Um it's a it's it, these movies i don't think will date very well because of that it's they're so heavy on on that um knowledge of of prior comic books of prior pop culture it it's they're they're very much of the age and i don't i, I don't know of again of, of the longevity of them because outside of that there's nothing really that's that begs you to to want to rewatch or, or revisit them because like i said the action is isn't all that great um you know it's 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 pretty it's pretty standard the the story as subversive as it wants to be is pretty standard and i don't know it's it, like like i i don't hate these movies or think they're awful i i think that they're fine but i also think that there's there's a limit that, that they have a very strict limit that they can hit and i think that they've hit it the first one was like my impression was that it was very surprisingly popular because i guess it was like hard r but also just really dumb and crude and my friend here she works at the movie theaters on the weekends and she says that actually this first opening weekend i guess people haven't been coming out as much for deadpool 2 i 
I don't know if you think they just hit their limit or you mentioned they like hit their limit. You think people are just tired of it? Or, yeah, I mean, I, 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 th- I it's, don't know. Or like maybe tired from Infinity War? Maybe. I don't, you know, who knows? It, it, it's kind of, you know, you know what you're getting with this movie and... I don't know. It's just I don't. I. I. I, It did. It did well at the box office. It didn't do bad. But it. it, It's just. I don't know. I think that it's kind of. It's kind of boring and lazy after a while when your your comedy uh, structure is built on just offhand remarks and snarkiness and and it's and I think that you can have that kind of stuff in there. You know, I was I was thinking actually of like. You know, watching something like a Marx Brothers movie where Groucho and and, and and all of them are just tossing out stuff just at just, you know, like lightning. They're just throwing jokes out there and none of them are really structured. They're just tossing things out there. And there I think that that's that, that that's more funny because of just the uh, the relentlessness and the uh, imperviousness of of everybody else around them. In Deadpool, it's more it's it. There's just something that's much more. I guess personal about it where he's literally looking at the camera and making some, you know, joke about Jared Kushner and or he's looking at the camera and making a joke about Thanos because Josh Brolin who plays Thanos is is in this movie. Uh I, I just the 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 fourth wall breaking of it just kind of grows tiring and I don't know. I, I like there again. It's a fine movie. It's okay. I think the second one's better than the first one. But at the it, it, there, were there a lot of laughs in the theater? Like, did the audience you were with seem it into it? Oh yeah, the the guy behind me was like <laughs> super. Like he oh, okay. he was he was down for it. Um, <laughs> he 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 was there for it. Um, I will say though that Zazie Beats, who I if if people may be familiar with her on TV, she's been on uh, Easy, the uh, Joe Swanberg series on Netflix, but she's most known for playing uh, the role of Donald Glover's on again off again girlfriend and baby mama on Atlanta. And she's fantastic in, in both of those shows. And she's really good here. She's very charismatic, very charming, uh, has some really genuinely great moments. And I kind of want to see more of her. I'd, I'd, ra- I'd rather watch her do stuff than than Deadpool wink at you the entire time. <laughs> uh, that's kind of my takeaway. And it, it, it was kind of funny to see Julian Dennison <laughs> because it was like clearly they were fans of Hunt for the Wilder People. And we're like, let's like bring that but to r-rated movies and you're like okay uh so yeah that's that's all i got a deadpool too it's it's a it's a very average very inconsequential very forgettable movie i don't i I honestly don't remember much from it other than that i was like zazzy beats i love you (laughs) in theaters now in theaters now deadpool (laughs) 2 I mean, honestly, if you, what I don't know what people expected uh, from what I had to say about it <laughs> after after my after after my whole thing on Infinity War a couple weeks after, ago. They're just yeah. like, yeah, just shut up. No, I feel like the last time we had an episode together, we also had like a good, bad, decent, good sandwich of reviews. Because uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw it to myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. No, you're no, no, you do I it all day. It's a new it's not new, it's ish. It came out last year. It came out last year. It's the Black Coat's daughter. It's directed by Oz Perkins, who is Anthony Perkins' kid. And he also has a film on Netflix called I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House. I don't know what <laughs> I cannot speak to that. Uh, <laughs> but the Black Coat's daughter. Okay. Um, it stars Emma Roberts and, forgive me, Kiernan Shippa. And it's got this kind of, it's a, a possession movie, essentially, but it's got this kind of fractured structure and it follows three separate girls, two of whom have been, I guess, abandoned, sort of. Their parents forgot about them at a Catholic 
boarding school like over Christmas break and they're just alone together and Kiernan Chippa's character is just weird like she's a weird girl and she's making the other one profoundly uncomfortable uh and then Emma Roberts character she's just alone out in the cold and the film implies she's making her way towards the school but we don't know why uh the original title for this film was february which i think was is a way better title because it's a very because it's a very chilly movie like the two girls at the school are not relating on any level the other girls kind of like quote-unquote bad girl she like sneaks out to go see her boyfriend and she may or may not be pregnant and she she's a senior and she's over it and the other girl's a freshman and she doesn't want to babysit the freshman so she tells her like stories about devil worship and how the nuns are secretly satanists uh as you do but like the little freshman as girl you do clearly takes it like way not taking it well she, she, her the kiernan shippa's performance is really i don't know it's weird and off-putting she's like looks haunted and then she gets it into her head that her parents have actually died and she's actually abandoned at the school and i don't know how spoiler you want to get for a film that's been out of here i didn't really know much going into it other than you know i think the pictures and like the menus like somebody grasping a bloody knife so you know something bad happens I, there's a there's an Obvious. image of Emma Roberts with blood on her hands covering her mouth yeah. so you know so <laughs> um but i just it's just a weird little chilly film and i've seen people comparing it to the witch uh cuz you have these like very this very isolated young girl character who doesn't really have anywhere to turn it in you know in the witch we've talked about how it um, it's just natural living in puritan england to turn to the devil because that's a better life objectively <laughs> like i'm sorry farming fucking sucks uh we just lost all of our farmer <laughs> listeners but okay <laughs> But this one, I guess it's set in modern day, and it's just like this weird reaction to being isolated and not really relating to the other girls or having or like a teacher character or any mentors. And it's so sad. I'm spoiling it. Sorry. But when at the end, she the freshman girl, she undergoes like an exorcism and she just kind of whispers don't go to the devil who may or may not be real it doesn't matter she really murders people quote unquote so eh. and i just has there andrew watched this movie like at, this seems like an andrew he has and he actually suggested it to me to see what i thought of it and it's weird like while it's happening you're just kind of like oh i don't know it's a little bit unsettling it's a little bit hard to relate and I'd, clearly I've still been thinking about it afterwards <laughs> and I don't know there's a twist with uh, like with who one of the characters turns out to be it's probably fairly obvious but she, I'm just going to say that after the exorcism she doesn't really get better I don't know if that's an improving you know experience so uh, I mean, that's true. <laughs> Even if you're not possessed by the devil, it seems like that's awful to go through. But it's not an exorcism movie. That's not the main point of it. So no worries. <laughs> or maybe worries. I don't know. It falls a little bit in between those genres of possession and ex. I don't know. <laughs> it's not as hysterical as it could be, which maybe is a good thing. I don't know. It's worth checking out. I'm not sure where you would find it. It is streaming on Amazon Prime. Thank you, Zach. 
So yeah, maybe check it out if that piqued your interest at all. It's a grower, I guess. Um. All right. Uh, a quick note before we, we go into break, though, I, I, I do want to highlight we have some new writing on the site. Uh, last week, Jessica and Andrew were talking about the Nashville Film Festival, and they had their whole rundown of that uh on the site earlier this week i don't think we talked about it last week but we've had a number of i mean we've been having some some reviews on for a while now jessica wrote about the amy schumer film i feel pretty uh michael o'malley wrote about arabian nights the 2015 three-part film from miguel gomez nathan uh wrote about it's on Netflix. Uh, Nathan wrote about Jeanette, the childhood of Joan of Arc, as well as Let the Sunshine In, the Claire Denis film with Juliette Binoche. And then uh, as of Wednesday, which this is when we're recording this, I put up a piece on 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Uh, and I talked about the film as well as the book that I just finished, uh, Space Odyssey, uh, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the Making of a Masterpiece by Michael Benson which if you're a fan of the movie you should definitely check it out this this you know you come away feeling like you know everything you need to know like in terms of like the backstory about this movie you don't understand what the movie's about but you understand the backstory uh but yeah so to definitely check out all that writing on cinematary.com we're going to take a short break though we will be back talking 1932's vampire with mark lee fanu Hello, Cinematary listeners. This is Zach Dennis with an important message because I have not talked to you enough during this episode. Uh, Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money. We're not clamoring for your dollars. At this time, we just want to enjoy each other's company and talk about the movies and feel our, you know, distribute our thoughts to the world and become podcasting moguls. You know, simple stuff. No money involved. Uh, However, there are a few things that you could do to help out the show. We would really appreciate it. The first thing is review us on iTunes. I know literally every podcast asks you this they're like please review us on itunes but it's like important because i don't know itunes this is what they do this is how this is how the apple lords constrict us and keep us in their system that's just what happens so we need a a nice little review just take like two minutes one day be like this is podcast review time put us on the list uh secondly you can tweet us we're at cinematary on twitter or better yet send us an email we're cinematary at yahoo.com so we can hear from you if you're just like zach uh you, you have terrible taste why do you keep talking about these superhero movies uh you keep talking also you keep talking about these japanese movies where all they do is 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 drink sake and smoke cigarettes and talk about how life's awful and i'll be like yeah what you're wrong and you'll be like yeah but i'm just emailing you and it'll be a whole thing it'll be a nice discourse think about it um and finally please tell your friends and family you know they should know as well i'm sure they like movies i'm sure they like podcasts we don't know uh to recap review on itunes itunes review day do that secondly send your thoughts twitter email one of those do it third share with your friends and family we would love it do it please thank you now let's get back to the show back with part two of episode 197 of cinematary in this part we will be continuing our young critics watch old movies series with 1932's vampire uh and we are joined all the way from london by mr mark lefanu uh his piece in the criterion collection is a is a must read for people who uh who watch this film mark thank you so much for joining us it's great to be here so i guess real quickly before we jump in uh vampire is a is a Carl Theodore Dreyer film, uh, and it follows it follows the story of a drifter who is obsessed with the supernatural, and on his on his quest, he stumbles upon this inn where a very ill adolescent girl is there, who they you know he comes to find out is so slowly becoming a vampire, and there is some supernatural elements with the different people around the inn, and and uh, he gets c- kind of caught up in that world. Um, so Mark, I guess. For First, to start out, let's talk a little bit about Dreyer. Um, in your piece, you discuss how in Vampire he's kind of shifting from the realm of silent movies because the one before this that he made was The Passion of Joan of Arc. Um, do you find that Vampire kind of, 
I guess even though it is a talky a sound film does it feel closer to a silent film than a sound film uh well i think most people would uh, think that it uh, feels very close to the silent epoch so this is uh this is odd in the sense that it came out in 1932 and uh um sound um sound sound movies have been going for four years by then and this is a i would say kind of a quite primitive Sound, uh, um, uh, sound film that uh, keeps many of the aspects of uh, of uh, silent movie, uh, of the silent movie epoch. Uh, the possible and various reasons for this. I mean, sound came in, of course. At uh, I don't know how, <laughs> how detailed you want me to be about this. I, I'm not giving a lecture, of course, but I mean, sound sound came in uh, over a period of years and in different places uh, it was uh, it was uh, slower than others so in Europe it was slower than in America and in other places like Russia and Japan it was even slower than in Europe uh, so so we're talking about a film that came out in 1932 but already by then in America the sound uh, sound technology was pretty advanced and uh, I was just thinking I recently re-seen a King Vidor film called uh, Street Scene a cool street scene, I think it is. Yeah, um, came out in 1931, and that's infinitely more advanced uh, technically in the in the sound uh, in the sound sphere than the trance film is. So, it's just, yeah. and so, and so, so in a sense, it's a kind of a um, yeah. I don't. Know, I mean, I don't know what to say really. I mean, uh, uh, what to add about that? I mean, I think that it was very difficult for uh, because in the early uh, period of European sound. Uh, experiments. Um, they want. They they were determined to do it. Uh, it they would record uh, different languages at the same time. So as you probably know, vampire vampire was recorded uh, silent, but the actors all mouthed the lines that they had in three different languages: in French, English, and German. Uh, which were then dubbed on later in Berlin in 1931. And that, of course, is a very kind of cumbersome way of doing things. And that could be the reason why, first of all, why the dialogue is so minimal in the movie, uh, and also why, in a sense, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it seems in a way, a certain way, perhaps you could argue, so clumsy. Well, that's what it, it just, I guess, kind of the way it, it moves and the way it, it kind of shifts through the narrative, it seems very much like a silent film. Like you said, there's not a lot of dialogue happening. Sorry, and it still uses like a lot of silent conventions, like a big chunk of it is him reading from the textbook in the library. Um, I, I, I agree. I agree. And of course, that's totally out of the, that's totally out of the silent uh, repertoire of, uh, of uh, tricks that you that that you can use. Of course, that's right. I, a little bit about Dreyer. You you also kind of talked a little bit about his, the personal aspect to this film that the director had, um, or at least you alluded to a, a a theory that the film historian Maurice Drozzi uh, wrote about when he was writing about Dreyer. Um, do you mind elaborating kind of on the personal collection connections that were made between Dreyer and this film? And do you really do you buy that theory that you were kind of talking about? Do you feel like th- those personal connections were, were being implemented on the story by the director? OK, so you're referring to um, uh, a book, a biography that came out about Dreyer by uh, French historian uh, Maurice Truzzi, who had l- lots of connections with Denmark in the 1980s. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, you'd say it's a kind of rather um, uh, Freudian in general. It's quite Freudian. Um, a lot of his analysis of other films um, um, bring in Freud and bring in the subconscious and so on. And, but in this film in particular, he, he kind of, uh, say, he kind of goes for broke in it. And he has an elaborate um, uh, uh, he has an elaborate kind of thesis which links the movie, uh, the characters in the movie, to Dreyer's own personal story, which we should probably just, you know, just go over very briefly, that Dreyer himself uh, was the illegitimate son of a Swedish nobleman uh, and, uh, and a Danish, uh, Danish servant girl. Uh, he was separated uh, from her uh, at birth. I mean, she gave him away. It was inappropriate, I suppose, to have illegitimate children in those days. So he was given over to Danish foster parents. Um, and a couple of years later, when he was only two, 
of course, couldn't have known about it then, but knew about it subsequently. His birth mother committed suicide um, by, uh, po- uh, by swallowing a box of poison patches. Uh, it's a kind of horrible, horrible way to go. And uh, anyway, Druzy in this, uh, uh, in his chapter on Vampire, um, uh, makes a kind of quite elaborate uh, translation here and is uh, saying that the, uh, uh, the aged female vampire uh, called Marguerite Chopin uh, in the film is his uh, is his foster mother whom he didn't like. Okay, fair enough. And uh, Leon, uh, the, Leon, the, uh, the 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 uh, victim of the the, the victim of the vampire is a, is in a sense his birth mother, his lost birth mother. And uh, in some strange way, in some strange phantasmagoric uh, way, what is happening here is a kind of a an, an acting out, a, a strange complex acting out of of what happened. Uh, and uh, and uh, so were appropriate blame placed on the stepmother and appropriate idealization made of the lost mother. Anyway, that briefly, I mean, there's more stuff that goes in there, but I, I say, so wh- what do you think about this? Um, well, um, uh, it's unfashionable these days to go in for um, uh, uh, Freudian, I think Freudian theories about uh, uh, interpreting art through, through Freud. It's a sort of seen as a reductive uh, way. And I, I'm not quite sure what I think about it, really. I think, I mean, I think one thing to say is that Drusy is a, is a, 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 a very intelligent, very knowledgeable, I, and I like him a lot. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't dismiss by any means uh, what he has to say uh, uh, and and that's what I say. I think in the in the uh, Criterion article, I, I sort of say, well, you know, let, you know, judge it, make your own judgment about it. Um, uh, 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 there's a, been a long-awaited biography by a, a Danish uh, film scholar, Kasper Tuber, uh, which we've been waiting for for ages and ages to come out. And it would be very interesting to see when the book finally emerges. You know, what Kasper has to has to say about it. In the meantime, we're, I think we're sort of left, uh, if I just finish this off, I mean, we're, we're left to make our own kind of uh, uh, observations about this. And I would certainly say that in, in the film Vampire, which is a very, uh, very, uh, um, it's, uh, I, I, w- I, I would say it has uh, good bits and bad bits in it. I don't think it's a completely achieved masterpiece by any means, but, but one of the most powerful moment it certainly is this strange moment when the actress Sybil Schitz uh, uh, looks uh, in, in this horrified way this moment in which uh, she's being tempted to commit suicide by the by the sinister doctor and uh, at that moment I mean I don't know if you if you've read Drusy and you've thought about it a bit and so on yeah it is possible what was going through Dreyer's mind uh, when uh, uh, when he wrote that bit in the script and when he filmed it uh, uh, we, can't, we can't ever know of course uh, but it's a reasonable speculation I would say and it, to me it's not it's not uh, obviously stupid yeah no it, it, it's it's definitely you know after reading the, the piece I, I kind of got um I feel like it's it's difficult. It's one of those things where it's difficult for a director not to at least have elements of of his or her personality kind of that that comes out in in the story. You know, you think of you, you think of like the early films of Charlie Chaplin. There's always those elements of his Victorian upbringing that were uh, that were there. You think of uh, you know just any 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 director in that age where they were kind of bringing that to the movie. So it's not, I, I feel like it's not absurd to think that Dreyer would be doing the same thing with his own film. Mm, sure. Sure. So, you know, naturally this, the, the film's title is vampire. And it, I, I was kind of thinking about it in terms of other, uh, vampire movies. You know, I think, uh, most people, think of something like Nosferatu from 1922 or even go to kind of the Hollywood staple of Dracula with Bela Lugosi um, do you view this film in the same kind of conversation as other vampire movies or is this something different is this something that's much more singular compared to the others well I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on vampire films and I come to vampire through Dreyer through my interest in Dreyer rather than through my interest in 
in vampire the occult or horror films and so on um but i mean i so as a as an amateur observation i what i would say is that uh, obviously uh, a dry new mona and uh, and, and, uh, and Nosferatu had made an enormous impression when it came out in 1922. The American uh, horror cycle that starts in Universal m- more or less this time, um, I doubt very much that uh, I doubt very much that Dreyer was uh, uh, influenced by that or or, or or even interested in it. I would mm. say. I'm not quite, quite not quite sure when Dracula came out. I think it was 1933, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, I think it's it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, we were here in we're not here in in a kind of um, uh, uh, a, a genre uh, a genre scatter. We're, we're we're here in the in the uh, uh, element of European art film. In fact, that's what we're dealing with here. So the closest. Uh, uh, closest connection, I would think, of is, is to Nosferatu and to German, and to German expressionism in general. I mean, of course, Ryan knew Germany extremely well and lived there for a long time. Yeah, well, that's that, that's that's one of the things I was thinking about. Uh, I I just recently watched the the German expressionist film from Morn to Midnight from 1922 or 23, I believe, and it kind of has a similar thing where um, Vampire doesn't have, of course, the aesthetic, the you know, the set design that a German expressionist film has, but I think in terms of its uh, its its character interactions and kind of the story that it wants to tell and how it tells it 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 really leans into that dreamlike quality which i think is something that's so uh so so alluring about about the film certainly absolutely absolutely it is a dream film of course absolutely and in that sense i suppose uh, since it was made in france you could say that it's kind of linked in a way to surrealism which, which was of course, hmm. of course the art of the art of dreams and and is indeed a french uh, uh, I mean, surrealism essentially comes from France. Um, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess kind of going again uh, to the dreamlike quality of the film, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it's it's interesting that this comes from an original story uh, that, that it's based on. Um, and I get, do you mind talking a little bit about this original story, the source material, and I guess why Dreyer decided to, to shift from the story, uh, which I found was very interesting, not only because he ch- chose that, but also because I guess a little bit of a, a personal connection that you could say you have with the, uh, with the source material and its author. Right. Yes. No. It uh, it says on the um, credits of the film that it's uh, taken or adapted from uh, uh, a, a collection of short stories by uh, my ancestor Joseph Sheridan Lefanu, uh, Irish ghost story writer in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, in particular, um, to, though it doesn't specify under the credits, but it's generally understood that the two uh, stories are the last two stories in the collection, The Room and the Dragon Volant. And uh, the, uh, but interestingly, sort of uh, quasi-lesbian <laughs> vampire story called Carmilla. So that's the, those are the, that, that's that's what it says on the credits, and uh, and, and yet as soon as you look, look at the film and uh, having read the, having read those two uh, having read those two stories, you see that the film is actually extre- extremely different. If it's an adaptation, it's an extremely liberal, loose mm-hmm. adaptation, and uh, he's found what he wants from it, doubtless, and uh, and uh, as it were, rejected uh, rejected the rest. So. Um, so, uh, shall we sort this out? Let's just take the okay from the the room in the dragon volant. There's as uh, as Casper Tierbeck says in his excellent uh, visual essay on the same Criterion disc. Uh, the whole business of being uh, screwed, uh, the terror of being screwed down into a uh, into a coffin, mm-hmm. uh, and being uh, carried, uh, and that sort of sense of claustrophobia and so on. And that's very that's very accurate because of the whole business of how the the, uh, the characters look down on the uh, on the as well, the victim lying there, the corpse who's not a corpse, who's uh, the living dead, as it were, and so on. All that comes from the second last short story in the collection, uh, a ghost story, as I say, called The Room, uh, The Dragon Volant. So that's that side of it. The Carmilla 
uh, thing. Well, the that was uh, first of all, the Carmilla is of course a female vampire, and although that Lefnus was not unique in making female vampires, uh, there have been a couple of French examples as, as well in the 19th century. Uh, it is a kind of quite uh, striking aspect of it, and what's quite striking in the story as you read it is is its uh, is the lesbianism. Um, uh, that that you know, doesn't speak its name, but you know does anything but speak its name. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's practically you know it's it's absolutely unmistakable when you read it. The way that Levenu describes uh, their lying together in bed and their kissing, and so so Carmilla is a is a young vampire. Very important thing to say, of course. Uh, Dreyer made her and uh, made his female vampire an old woman, and gave her an odd name, Marguerite Chopin, and so on. Uh, so uh, yes, the the connection there of the uh, uh, the, the connection with Camilla comes through the female vampire, but otherwise uh, the the actual plot of the stories are completely different. I mean, completely different. I mean, for a start, to Camilla's set in Austria, and it has a whole kind of uh, combination of incidents which simply don't appear. And yet, for a start, it's told uh, through the voice of a young girl, the young girl who is vampirized by Carmilla. Um, so so it's, 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 it's totally different. So uh, let's, uh, let's just say a last thing about this. I mean, this is, a, this is something that Casper uh, uh, Tuberk has uh, suggested. There was, uh, the, that um, Dreyer always used a kind of uh, a literary basis of, of his scripts. All the scripts he read were always taken a, a literary adaptation, unlike some people who simply you know, invent their own stuff. And uh, there'd been a big problem with Nosferatu. Uh, there'd been a, a legal uh, mm-hmm. case because, uh, um, because Dracula uh, was... Um, uh, was um, uh, what's the word? It was still in copyright. Uh, and therefore, I mean, Bram Stoker's Dracula was still in copyright and uh, they were uh, the 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 film the producer of the film was sued for that the point about um uh, in a glass darkly it was that Lefnu had died a sufficient number of years before so it wasn't in copyright so he was safe about that so there's a sort of possibly an element of so really quite opportunistic element but until as i say until Tuber comes up with the uh, with the goods we don't really know i mean uh, i mean uh, all sorts of things were happening in the period 1928, 1929. Who was this guy, Kristen Yule, who is, uh, who is uh, uh, Dreyer's um, uh, co-scenarist on this? What input did he have? What input did Baron Nicholas de Grunsberg have as well? I mean, he talks about reading lots of ghost stories with uh, Dreyer and finally alighting on in a, in a glass darkly. Uh, and so on. There are all sorts of things that we don't quite know that we, we can only speculate about. It's kind of there. It's in the mix. Uh, we, we'll we'll know a bit more about it <laughs> when the biography comes. Yeah. Did uh, Dreyer come up with the really creepy, I don't know, shadow projection stuff? Uh, the little henchmen were doing. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, have you read the script? I mean. Mm. I, I mean, it's all there in the script. So, okay. so, uh, so it's there. The, the, this kind of whole business of uh, the doubles and the shadows and all the rest were fascinating for him. Uh, that's part of German expressionism. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's actually a wonderful film called Schatten, Shadows, that came out uh, uh, a little bit before this. So, you mean shadows are of course part of uh, the ghost repertoire. So he spent, obviously, he spent, he and Mate, the uh, cameraman, spent a lot of time and effort in setting those early scenes up with all Mm -hmm. the uh, shadow stuff. I mean, it's rather ingenious and kind of rather good part of the film, I think, a rather successful part Mm -hmm. of the film, uh, I would say. Uh, But I don't know, it it must have been terribly difficult to do. You know that the the whole uh, shooting was a complete... Terribly tormenting, tormented. I mean, I was beginning to go into a kind of a nervous breakdown, and uh, and uh, Drusy talks about strange homosexual things going on. Right? So, to go back to the lesbian aspect of the moment, the, the Dry himself, though married and with children, uh, uh, was um, possibly gay. Once again, find out more about this in due course. But he was in love with the assistant cameraman. So it is said. 
and there were all sorts of uh, kind of terribly difficult to you know, sort of psychic <laughs> problems going on the whole time. Uh, it's all too far away probably in history to ever really find out what the truth of the matter was. I don't know how we got talking about it. No, so you were talking about shadows. <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, that's, 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 that's definitely uh, an interesting, I, I think it just kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with the, uh, the kind of implementing you know his own personality onto the onto the film itself um i, I want to talk for a moment about the horror aspect of this movie because i you know i guess it is classified as a horror movie um and while it i don't i don't necessarily feel like it scared me i i will say that one of the, the things that was so striking about the film uh and it kind of goes back to the passion of joan of arc but it's his focus on faces and you alluded to the scene earlier but there's a scene where leon uh, is being tempted uh, by the doctor to take the poison uh, and commit suicide and the way that she turns her head and, and turns into this has this sinister grin on uh, it reminded me a lot of like Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lamb it's 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 just so uh, it's so um, it just takes a while to, yeah it's so expressive it takes a while to really fully uh, you know take shape um, are there any scenes in the film that just really really you know frighten you or uh are is it you know is it more of just a uh are you more just kind of looking at just the the striking images that that are on, that are on the screen yeah I, I i think i think perhaps the latter really i mean i i think there are more definitely more uh scary films than this i think that the the scene uh, where her where Sybil Shears' face becomes a kind of a, a, a strange, sinister, semi-sexual grin of uh, grimace or rictus uh, is indeed a kind of rather terrifying moment. Um, but, I mean, all this leads into something that I'd like to try with you, I'd like to talk to you about and see what you think about it. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I hinted earlier that I don't, I don't think the film is a, is total uh, is is artistic a total uh, total success mm-hmm. so it's i think it's kind of a uh, i mean it's got it's full of kind of wonderful experimental things in it and I, which i definitely don't want to condescend to at all but um, but there's a kind of problem in it for me which is it has to do almost with the with the editing and I, i'll put it like this that um the, the 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 camera work in the film is is often very, as you've noticed, is kind of very fluid, mm-hmm. and we get some we get some really nice travelling shots. We get some panoramas and some nice travelling uh, inside the various uh, uh, inside the various locations, uh, either in the in the inn or in the castle itself, or in the or in the strange uh, kind of uh, 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 house that the doctor and the uh, and the sinister lady live in, so so there's so it's not that the camera is kind of um, stuck or static or anything. I mean the camera moves around fairly fluently, but what it doesn't do is it never connects uh, or never sufficiently connects one room or one layer of where we are, what one as it was uh, uh, story uh, with the with the uh, I mean story in the in the sense of etage of uh, uh, you're, you're never quite sure whether you're on the ground floor mm-hmm. on the first or second floor and so on and so forth and um, and this and and to me this is a kind of I mean you could say it's a dream and and you just sort of it doesn't matter then because in a dream you're sort of everywhere and uh, everywhere at the same time but to me he kind of missed a few tricks there somehow um, uh, in making in sort of drawing these locations together and making them all of a piece and and I was trying to sort of, I was trying to uh, work out in, in my own mind you know what what the problem was there and and it, and it seems to me that there's there's too much kind of cross-cutting in the film in general and cross-cutting is always the enemy of suspense griffith thought he was the friend of suspense but to me it's the enemy of suspense because when you cross-cut you move away from the thing that you're in into something else Mm -hmm. and that and and that and that that that, that's bad for suspense and then you move back again and then you move back again and so on let's go forth and uh and there's a lot of cross-cutting you see at the at the beginning when he arrives at the inn, and there's a great deal of stuff between him looking at the inn and the chap 
uh, with the scythe crossing the river and so on. And right at the end also in the uh, this cross-cutting between uh, the, the couple, uh, Giselle and uh, and uh, the, whatever we call the name, I can't remember what the name, what is the name of the, of the hero? Uh, what's Alan or David. Alan, Alan, Alan or David or, or Julian indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Things, apparently, so so um, so yeah. There's a lot of cross cutting, which which uh, belongs to in a way belongs to the silent movie. But Dreyer himself became a marvelous master of the sequent shot in later films. I mean, above all in in Orvet and in uh, Gertrude. Uh, where he, he he totally rescinds. He he, he uh, there's no more cross cutting in those films. And what that allows you to be is you're allowed to be then in in the space the whole time, mm -hmm. and you're there and the kind of so you're not taken out of it all of a sudden and then put back in it. And I feel that that's the kind of that to me would be if you wanted to sort of try and say what, what was the thing that bugs me a bit about uh, the uh, photographic style in the movie and why it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite sort of all mm. come together in a marvelous way. Well, uh, one thing that struck me that disturbed me was cross-cutting it. I think it's the very end you were talking about the couple were walking around hand in hand in sunshine or whatever. And then intercut with that is, I guess it's the doctor character getting his comeuppance and being buried in flower. And I actually thought that juxtaposition was really disturbing. I, like, it's not scary, but just back and forth between. It's like, oh, they're happy ending. And then. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I, I completely agree. And uh, uh, stylistically, uh, the, uh, it's completely different, isn't it? Because the the uh, the, the the scenes in the flour mill are, mm -hmm. are very very clear cut. I mean, actually, rather beautiful. I mean, all the scenes of the moving machinery is absolutely terrific. And of course, the, the death of the doctor himself is <laughs> is really <laughs> splendid. <laughs> and uh, one well, wonders. I mean, uh, Dreyer went quite far, uh, as as they did in in, the, in 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 those days, in kind of putting putting the actors through it. I mean, I would hope that the doctor didn't feel at any moment that his life was in danger. Okay, yes. but, but there's that. That, that's shot in a certain way. And then the way that the uh, couple are shot, they're shot in kind of soft focus, misty. Mm -hmm. kind of, it's a totally different kind of palette, you would say, if you were a painter there. And they don't, stop, they somehow don't match. They're from a different movie at that point, I feel. So uh, so that's, yeah, I, I would feel a little, that's, that's a criticism, you might say. <laughs> we're allowed to criticize. Yes. Great. <laughs> Well, it, I think it kind of plays into uh, the way that this film, the movie kind of wants to almost be somewhat of a haunted house film where you, you're in this confined space and it wants to, you know, create fear just by the by you knowing the the uh, amount of space that you have in this in this one area. And. I don't, I don't, yeah, I think I agree that I don't necessarily feel like he ever uh, he ever really institutes that this is the specific amount of space that we have that we're that we're going to be in, and it kind of uh, takes a little bit away from the movie. Um, now, having said, I, I just think I, I, I'm just thinking of the shi I'm just thinking of The Shining and the way that Kubrick is always you always know exactly where you are in that film, and uh, and that, that's what's so scary about. It. I don't know. The Shining throws you off a little bit because it's an impossible building, and I'm not sure if Dreyer's that interested in connecting all these spaces. It kind of leaves you uh, off balance a bit. Now, you know, even though that may, that aspect of the kind of camera work may not have worked, uh, the one thing I did really kind of enjoy was the fluidity of, of the panning shots that he had. There would be those those scenes where he the camera would just be kind of in the stagnant position and, you know, it, they would move from left to right and action was kind of playing out within the foreground, but it wasn't always necessarily the focus of what was, was you know, in front of the camera. Um, it's kind of it's it seemed like something that was a little uh, you know ahead of its time but uh kind of uh, again played to that uh it felt very dreamlike it felt like it was it was uh it felt very within the that realm that we are in in this movie yeah no no i i, I know i rather agree with you there no i rather agree obviously it's it's very experiment um and kind of unusual and uh, it's about you know summoning an atmosphere uh, uncanny of the kind of left right 
uh, I, mean, I yeah, I think it totally succeeds. And I, I, I'm sorry if my I, I, I got off on a bit of a tangent a few minutes ago, you know, criticizing. It, it, it is it, visually it is extraordinary and then let's let's just uh, let's just confirm that uh, I absolutely agree the one thing I was curious about is is also uh, you know you, you mentioned in in the essay but dryer is one of those names that comes up with a lot of film scholars and and f- film fans as as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time um, and I'm not sure where you stand on that if you if you categorize him that way but uh, I guess, what do you think kind of garners that sort of praise? What what about Dreyer as a director, as a filmmaker, is so special? Yes, well, I think I think he is. I think he's kind of one of the the kind of the uh, inner inner circle, really. Um, I think he's one of the greats, uh, certainly. Um, um, uh, and that any uh, you know, any serious student of film would would have to come across dry at some stage and uh and uh make an account of him so w- what is it what was what was uh, that was uh, that was wonderful about him he was, he was an extraordinary human being i mean that's that's an interesting aspect of it i mean that's not about his films but that's about him i mean his uh, dedication to film art is the kind of a purity of his dedication his film writings are incredibly beautiful it all came out in a little book a few years ago called uh, Dryer in Double Focus, which is available in the American paperback. And if you read those essays, uh, he's a wonderful writer about film. Um, so, okay, this is a rather roundabout way to kind of get there. This is saying, first of all, you know, he's a great guy in a certain way. Uh, he's a tremendous writer and, in a way, a theorist of film. Um, um, uh, but uh, the films themselves, well, the films that we know are the, the the sound films. I mean, the majority of his films that he made were in the, in the 1920s, I suppose, but were silent films, and they're harder to get hold of. But uh, um, the two films that he, no, the three films that he made after uh, Von Pierre, uh, the film called uh, uh, Day of Wrath in 1943, which he made during the Second World War, which is a story about witches, and then his extraordinary film about uh, resurrection about uh, the, the girl, the woman who dies and gets resurrected, Oret, the word, which came out in 1955, and then his last film, Gertrude, which came out in 1964, I think. So these three films are quite extraordinary, brilliant masterpieces. And if I had to pick up one of them, it would be the middle one, the one called Oret, which I, I would say is simply one of the greatest films that have ever been made. Um, and kind of, I would invite, have you seen it? Have, uh, is this a film you've seen? Zach? No, this is the only, this is Vampire is the is the second dryer outside of the Passion of Joan of Arc that I've seen, but I, I'm definitely that's why I'm a, I'm kind of curious to ask this because he's somebody I feel like I should uh, look more into because I've really enjoyed this film and Joan of Arc and uh, there was just something so striking, so singular about his work, the two films that I've seen that you know interests me in in, in kind of looking further at at, at his work as a whole right well i mean i'd say the films of the 1920s are rather good i mean some of them they were, they, he made a comedy strange to think of dry making a comedy called master in the house uh, which is terrific uh um a beautiful film that he made in norway called the bride of Blomdal. um strange um, quasi gay uh, film called mikhail which he made in berlin a very expressionistic uh, film in the 1920s um, these are all these are all interesting films as well. Um, I mean, I don't think that. I mean, you couldn't compare. I mean, someone like Bergman, for example, take it, the other the other great Scandinavian film director. I mean, Bergman made over fifty films, and uh, and his life was kind of uh, endlessly involved in, in in work and creativity. And I don't think that uh, that anyone would say that that Dreyer, just in terms of productivity, was up there. But in terms of kind of purity of purpose. Uh, of uh, sublimity uh, when he reaches sublimity as I think he does in, at the end the last reel of Oret I am pronouncing it in the Danish way it's sometimes called Ordet so that's spelled the word it means the word, a religious film a Christian film uh, uh, which, uh, which uh, allows us to see a resurrection take place in front of our eyes I mean there's something uncanny about that mm-hmm. 
anyway, um, is uh, and I challenge anybody to see that film and not come out a changed person. I mean, uh, it's, uh, yes, it's one of the most staggering works of uh, fiction I've ever been put on film. I mean. uh, so, uh, anyway, <laughs> a few thoughts about why I think he's so great. So, I mean, he's to me, he's like, he's like um, Murnau, he's like uh, Mizuguchi. Uh, he's a, he's a where filmmaker's filmmaker. I mean, uh, mm. uh, or, 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 or even to take a, an, another totally different kind of question was Lubitsch. I mean, there, there are marvelous masters of the of the uh, early of the silent period of the hybrid period of the sound and so on, uh, who are not as well known by the public as uh, probably should be. But when you get to know them, you just see what incredible masters they were. And uh, and, and then certainly I think that uh, a dry belongs to that category. Well, Mark, thank you so much for, for talking with us and, and talking a little bit about the film and dryer in general. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a great pleasure. And that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at handle at cinematary, and on Letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash cinematary, where we put all of the movies that we talked about this week into a handy little list. Next week, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series with 1946's My Darling Clementine. And for this episode, we will be joined by really one of the great film scholars and and I'll just say maybe a personal friend. He might not agree agree to that, but Mr. Scott Eyman, who has written extensively on John Ford and uh, his most recent book was about Jimmy Stewart and and Henry Fonda, who stars in Clementine. Uh, It's a great film. I've seen it a number of times. I'm really excited to talk about it with Scott. He's kind of the the guy to go to, especially for Western. So looking forward to that episode next week. But until then, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you then. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. I wanted to take one final moment to remind you to check out Audible and get a free 30-day free trial just for being a listener of Cinematary. You can start your trial by going to www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary and picking through over 180,000 titles that can be accessed from your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, or even your MP3 player. Again, that link is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. See you next week.